Hi guys, Jared here, and well, this month is a very special month for the Sega Saturn. This bad boy right here turned 20 years old. That's right, this bad boy turned 20 years old this month. It was actually last week or so, I believe it was, that uh, the system actually turned um, 20. I'm not sure when you guys are going to watch this video, so I just I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Saturn. Let's be honest, uh, right now here on YouTube, we probably talk about the Saturn more than most people do. So I'm not going to go too much into detail about, you know, the history of the console. If you're interested, just hit up the Sega Saturn playlist here on the channel and you'll see a wide assortment of videos. I've done a bunch of vlogs, I've done history about the system, and we're covering more games uh, for the Sega Saturn than almost any other channel on YouTube, at least as far as I know. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe there's like Sega Saturn fan number one who has like reviewed every game on the system, but that's my goal is to review every North American uh, Sega Saturn release, with the exception of some of the sports titles, because uh, those have aged quite poorly. So yeah, happy birthday to the Sega Saturn. I cannot believe it's 20 years old. This system, which is actually in the box here, this is the one that Steven sent me, this uh, was one of the very first systems that I ever bought with my money. I worked for it, and I saved up, and I bought this system. It was... Awesome. It was the first system in that generation. Um, well, that generation, there may be more systems, but I consider the Sega Saturn, the Sony PlayStation, and the Nintendo 64. I consider that the generation. I, I know I think it was the, the Jaguar, I think it was, but I wasn't into it. I have no, uh, no interest in, um, in checking that out or, or anything. Even now, I, I really don't have much interest in it. So yeah, uh, for me, those three systems make up that generation and being able to actually buy that with my own money uh, was, was an amazing feeling. Like I say, I mean, that was the first time I had ever done that and then I purchased the PlayStation afterwards and then I purchased the N64 as each one came out. But it was in 1995 when uh, the Sega Saturn launched, May 1995, a surprise announcement at E3 when Tom Kalinske came out and said, oh, by the way, it's available right now. Uh, that would prove to be a disastrous move for, uh, for Sega, and this was actually the beginning of the end for them. Uh, after the disastrous uh, Sega Saturn launch, they were never able to really capitalize on the... Um, on the market. They were never able to, to bring it back and that's mainly because uh, their main competitor, which wasn't Nintendo, believe it or not, was the Sony PlayStation. Sony had everything going right for them and while the Saturn was a success story in Japan, it wasn't anywhere else and it was kind of interesting how Sega never really had a worldwide hit outside of their arcade business. And, I always thought that was really, really interesting. Like, the Genesis was a huge success in North America, but uh, if you look at Japan, it was a distant third after the, uh, after the Super Famicom and after the TurboGrafx-16 are over there, as it was known as the PC Engine. I thought that was always very, very, very interesting. So, like I say, I'm not going to talk too much about the history of all this. You all know this. Instead, what I wanted to do was uh, just, you know, hold up, as I usually do, a couple of games that really helped define this platform. Uh, and I went really quickly through some of the games that I have out here that are still pending review or some of the ones that I've already reviewed. So, obviously, this is not everything. This is not my entire collection. So, the one thing that the Sega Saturn really did was it introduced imports to me. And I know you guys, if you've watched the channel for any length or period of time, you know that I, um, I had a friend from Japan who came to Canada and uh, he brought his Famicom and Super Famicom and, um, and I, used to, I used to play imports with him at his house and he would walk me through. That's how I, I really got into uh, Dragon Quest. Um, but anyway, whatever. The point is that the Sega Saturn was the system that truly opened the world of imports to me. It was the first system where I was like, okay, like, 
you have to import games on this system. And there were a couple of titles that really stood out for me, and there's a lot of games. I'm only going to show a, a few things here. Um, the big one, the big, big one was this bad boy right here. This is X-Men vs. Street Fighter. And what was so amazing with this, this is uh, the nice big one, the deluxe one that came with what I'm going to show you right here, which was the RAM expansion card cart and here it is this is the four megabyte ram expansion uh, card and this was a really big deal because this allowed the game to pretty much look and feel like uh well like something else i own it it allowed it to sort of look and feel like this this is X-Men vs. Street Fighter. This is one of my favorite arcade games of all time. And that's exactly what this is. This is the CPS 2 A and B boards. Uh, you would connect this port here, this is the JAMA port, directly to your arcade cab. This would sit inside the arcade cab. And that fan, let me tell you how loud that is, you have no idea. <laughs> anyway, um, and so by having that RAM cart, this tiny little thing compared to this, I mean, look at the size of this, uh, they were almost identical. They really were. Where am I going to put this now? Um, they, they were really, it, it really was the beginning of this arcade perfect uh, period where, where games like this were matching that arcade board almost exactly like they had all the extra frames of animation and it would put the PlayStation version to shame. Another one that really really has a special place in my heart uh, maybe not so much as this in terms of the social aspect because friends would come over all the time when I got this. I mean this game has been played more than I think more than any other Sega Saturn game I own just because friends would come over constantly like, oh, let's play X-Men vs. Street Fighter, let's play X-Men vs. Street Fighter, and, and yeah. The other one that I personally really had a blast with, which I can't find, I, I've got boxes all over the place and I just don't know where I put it, is uh, Radiant Silver Gun. I put in hours in that game, and it's, it's locked up with a couple of North American games that I hope I can find because I really don't want to have to rebuy these games, uh, especially Radiant Silver Gun. That's ex quite expensive right now. And I paid 50 bucks, I think it was, when it uh, came out. Anyways, that's a, it's a great shmup from uh, Treasure. They would go on to do Ikaruga, and they made uh, Gunstar Heroes, and, and a whole bunch of other games. And um, I put in hours into that game. I loved that shooter. And another one that uh, I, I did not have uh, time to really check out back in the day too much, but one that I've actually grown to appreciate a lot, uh, actually rather recently, was this right here. Oh, you can see the camera there, sorry about that. Uh, that's Deep Fear. This is uh, basically a uh, survival horror game. I've actually reviewed it. I did it as part of the Halloween special um, last year. We're actually thinking of doing that again. I had a really good time with Steven doing that, reviewing all these different games uh, for a week. And anyway, yeah, so Deep Fear is a, is a really good, it's a fantastic game. And a real shame that never came out in North America. It came out in uh, Europe, though, so if you can snag a European copy, it was the last game released for the Sega Saturn, so kind of expensive. But anyway, uh, so those are just uh, two imports I just wanted to highlight. The main one being X-Men vs. Street Fighter and the fact that uh, Radiant Silver Gun was also there. But when this platform launched, we had... Well, it, it came with... Virtua Fighter was the main one that it came with and they would go on and release a Virtua Fighter Remix, which I, I've reviewed both of these very good games um, But it felt rushed Okay, the, and it was I mean, let's say let's just call it what it is uh, The Saturn when it came out it was rushed. It was really really rushed to market and uh, What else do I have here? Um, another one that was pretty big when it came out was uh, Was this right here? which was Daytona USA and this one too it didn't it didn't it felt fun it was it was that arcade action that was a that was a real like blast however it uh, it simply didn't 
didn't look as good as it should have, especially compared to uh, what was being pumped out on the PlayStation, at least from what we had seen from magazines and stuff like that. And also there were some demos that were being set up at the time in uh, some of the video game stores. So you would you'd put this on and it was a lot choppier than something like uh, Ridge Racer, for example. But you know what? At the end of the day, like I said, I didn't care about any of that crap. I just wanted to experience these arcade games. I loved the arcades. I mean, X-Men vs. Street Fighter, I think was 96, 97? I, I know the game here is... Actually, what am I doing? I have the arcade board right here. Let's see what it says on it. Uh, 1996. So there you go. So the arcade board here, this was released in 1996, which was already sort of like on that peak where uh, arcades were slowly but surely dying. By the way, the CPS2 system, I love these, man. I really love these. If I had more space and more money, I would have almost all of these because I absolutely love uh, the, those arcade games. Anyway, so... Um, yeah, I was a big fan of arcades, and when they were moving, transitioning to 3D games like this and Virtua Fighter, I thought this was, like, amazing. This was going to be another revolution. What I didn't know was that the home consoles were slowly catching up, and by the time the Dreamcast came out, arcades would pretty much be dead, because why would you go to the, the, the store and put in our store, an arcade, uh, well, just an arcade, put in a quarter to play a game that looked identical to the one that you have at home. But the one you have at home, you just press the start button to get another life instead of putting in a quarter, 50 cents, a dollar. And so, yeah, that's what eventually killed it out. But there's nothing like going to an arcade and experiencing some of these gems from back in the day. It was just, it was really something. So let's keep going. Um, another big launch title that I recall is this right here, Panzer Dragoon. This was a real big one and it would, it would actually lead to uh, two other fantastic games, which would be Panzer Dragoon 2, uh, which was just, it was the ultimate, like, rail shooter, if you want to call it that, what, where Panzer Dragoon introduced us to uh, this, this, you know, unique world. Panzer Dragoon 2 really went wild with it. They introduced transformations, there was land sections as well as flying, it was just a much more well-rounded and fleshed out experience and it's just a fantastic game. And I don't understand why Sega really hasn't put out a Panzer Dragoon uh, collection. Uh, not now, now the company is pretty much dead, they're, they're like mobile only uh, and a few other, you know, and Sonic. But uh, I know that there, there was all these rumors and stuff saying that, you know, source codes were gone, but there had to have been a way for them to figure this out. Anyway, and um, the Holy Grail uh, on the Sega Saturn is this. This was released extremely late in the Saturn's life because unfortunately this system only went from 1995 to 1998. And by 1998, I don't really consider these games that, you know, helped the system out. This was, it was already like dead. These games in 1998, I believe there were five or six that were released. That's it. And the whole year... So, it's pretty much, you know, that was it. So, it was dead pretty much by 97. Like, by the end of 1997 is when the Saturn was pretty much finished. And at E3 in 1997 is when that famous line, uh, when Bernie Stoller came out and said, oh, the Saturn's not our future. Well, that pretty much did it. That was the end of it. And it's one of the main reasons why, in 1998, we only got a couple of games. It's why games like... Uh, X-Men vs. Street Fighter weren't released in North America, why the RAM cartridge was never released here, like, they just totally gave up. They were like, forget it. Uh, today, this is one of the most sought-after games on the Sega Saturn. It's uh, probably the second most expensive game on the system after, uh, after uh, Daytona USA Netlink Edition, which I'll get to in a bit. Uh, but the Sega Saturn, man, like, this was a unique game. And that's sort of what the system came to represent to me, this uniqueness. PlayStation hit the mainstream, N64 sort of retained that Nintendo magic when they went into 3D. But with 
with the Saturn, it wasn't like, oh, we're just going to, you know, do what we did with the Genesis. They went nuts. They tried a lot of different things. And with Panzer Dragoon Saga, they weren't content with what they had done with Panzer Dragoon and Panzer Dragoon 2. No, instead they they went crazy and they made an actual, like, an open world uh, RPG. Uh, well, open world, that might be pushing it a little bit uh, far. But it was a breathtaking 4 CD uh, masterpiece that is really sought after today and it's 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 held up really well it's just that you know the, the question is is it worth like five hundred dollars would you go and buy this game for five hundred bucks and that I can't answer only only you can another thing on the Saturn that really you know really was awesome was uh, I'm not talking about just a game this is Dragon Force it was uh, uh, right here let's look on the spine Right there, it was these bad boys. It was working designs. Working designs, I mean, just look at the the quality here. The, everything was just so awesome. If you look at the Sega Saturn, it's got like a foil on it, the the, uh, the logo and everything, and it, it just, they came into their own here. I know on the Sega CD they had already started, but with the Saturn, man, they, they went all out. They went all out. They actually released the last game. I don't believe I took that one out, did I? No. With uh, Magic Knight Ray Earth. And uh, they released, I think it's six. I have them all. They're all here. Um, I'm going to actually... I haven't covered these actually yet. I've got I've to gotta get to work on these. Um, they're great games. They're absolutely great games. And... It was great that, you know, they supported the Saturn all the way to the end. And this game in particular, Dragon Force, another very sought-after game. It's a, uh, what is it? It's a strategy RPG. And there's like a bajillion sprites. It's a shame Part 2 never made it over here, but you know what? It doesn't matter. You can have up to like 200 sprites on the screen at one time with like virtually no slowdown. It's a really, another, another really, really great game. And uh, now I'm just going to pull out a couple that I have got here. Uh, here's Duke Nukem 3D. Uh, you'll notice in the corner up here, I don't know how well that's going to show up, it says Net Link Playable. This was the other thing that the Sega Saturn did uh, that was pretty awesome. While there was uh, uh, an X-Band modem for the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis, it wasn't as, as officially uh, recognized by... Sega and or Nintendo, but with the Netlink adapter, this was like the first time really that Sega came forward and was like, okay, we are pushing online. Uh, you'll be able to take this game, play cooperatively or in deathmatch, and this game was released in 1997. I mean, think of that. In 1997, there was a console out where you could browse the web and you could actually play games together, online together. That That's sick. I mean, that's absolutely sick. I actually did a video showing all of that, and I never actually reviewed this one. Um, I'll have to dig out the keyboard, the Saturn keyboard and mouse, because this game is compatible with it. It makes it so much uh, easier to play. Uh, but yeah, so that was, again, Sega pushing boundaries, man, really going all out there, which was... Um, well, it wasn't surprising, because that was what Sega was all about at that time. And I never even knew about the, the Netlink adapter. And even if I did, I never would have been able to afford the, the subscription service and all of that. And it was basically a, an attachment that you put inside the Saturn's cartridge slot, and, um, and you connected it through dial-up. And believe it or not, but these games are all still online today, because they're not uh, server-based. They're peer-to-peer. So you can actually buy these games today and, uh, and go to town, man, and they're all online, so you can have fun. Okay, next up, the, the Saturn was also home to some pretty awesome 2D games, and here's just one example. This is Guardian Heroes. This is an amazing game that I have actually yet to review, and I don't know why. I, this is one that I keep forgetting to review. This is actually a playable game up to six 
characters or six players can actually play this one and it's essentially a beat-em-up it's uh, one of those you know left to right double dragons type of game but it's extremely deep it was games like this that needed better marketing and for God's sakes better box art than that uh, but unfortunately at its time 3D was was king and the Saturn just wasn't putting out as impressive 3D games as the uh, Sony PlayStation was. But I don't technically agree with that. I think it's mainly the fact that like a lot of third party developers were having a hard time with the architecture of the Saturn and because of that there was just more games coming out on the Sony PlayStation and they got just more comfortable with the architecture. But it's a real shame that games like this just got sort of ignored by the masses. And today, this is another really sought-after game. This is a fantastic one, guys. And when I review this, you'll see why. And I know why I didn't review this one yet. It's because I'm waiting to have at least one other player here so that I can show uh, multiplayer. The next thing that I really loved was like this, House of the Dead. I've reviewed this. I reviewed this and the two Virtual Cop games. This is a brilliant shooter. Is it amazing on the Saturn in terms of visuals? No, but it's fun and that's the thing with Sega. They've always been a truly fun company and the Sega Saturn really encompassed that. It really showed that but it was largely ignored for its time and today I'm glad that it's slowly starting to um, to get recognized by the masses and it's about bloody time because it's a brilliant system. Alright, this is going to make some room here. Another one that, uh, and like I said, I'm not showing everything here, is uh, Nights into Dreams. I've, uh, I think I reviewed this probably a long, long time ago. But uh, Nights into Dreams was basically Sega's answer to Mario 64 and Crash Bandicoot. And what I liked is that it really was different. It had that sort of arcade sort of flair of just picking it up, playing it, having a blast for a little bit of time, and then putting it down or trying to beat your scores, and, and, and I loved that. But again, the masses, uh, people's tastes were changing. But this was one of the highest selling games on the uh, Sega Saturn. So that says something. Uh, going back again to uh, the Netlink adapter. Here's Saturn Bomberman. Another one that um, is in extremely high demand right now. Because it's one of the, the uh, only games that features 10 local players. 10! And you can also go up, I believe it's four. Yeah, you can uh, connect with up to four players online in 1997. If you have a really huge, like 60 inch or 50 inch uh, LC, well, whatever, it doesn't have to be an LCD, but an HD TV, get an RGB SCART cable, get something like the XRGB Mini or another upscaler, and put this on that TV, invite in 10 players, get a whole bunch of multi-taps, and let me tell you, you will never have as much fun as you will with this. This, to this day, remains one of the best party games ever. It's just a shame that it requires so many damn multi-taps and things like that, but uh, just an absolute, an absolute blast. All right. And I will cover that game, but that's another one where I want to show the single player and I would like to have at least one other player uh, around. Okay, uh, another one that, um, that is in quite high demand is this right here. This is the North American version of the Street Fighter collection. And this was interesting because for its time, you got to remember that by this, by this point in time, um, Capcom had already moved on to Street Fighter Zero or Street Fighter Alpha, which took place in between the original Street Fighter game and Street Fighter 2. And so when we got this, uh, I don't recall when exactly it was released, but it was cool because it was a nice throwback. It was like, okay, well now we're going to give you the games that you got on the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis. So we're going to collect some of the Street Fighter 2 uh, ports. And uh, we're also going to throw it, well, let's see, what, what it, it comes with Super Street Fighter 2 and Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, as well as Street Fighter Alpha 2 Gold, which had a couple of uh, new features on it. So this was obviously released after Street Fighter Alpha 2. 
And um, what's interesting with this one is, while it would come with uh, Super Street Fighter 2 and Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, they actually released a second collection, but only on uh, the PlayStation in North America because, again, they, they discontinued the Saturn extremely quickly. But in Japan, there was a, I think it's, uh, it was called Capcom Generations, I want to say, and it was the fifth one. They, they made five of them, or six of them. Oh, gosh, I don't even remember. Anyway, whatever. It may have been the fourth one. But it included the other Street Fighter games from that era. So Street Fighter 2, The World Warrior, uh, Street Fighter 2 Turbo, and uh, is that it? Uh, no, I think it was also Championship Edition. I think it was those three. Then you couple that with Super Street Fighter 2 and Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, and there you go. You had all the Street Fighter games for this particular generation. Plus all of these other amazing games like X-Men vs. Street Fighter, Marvel uh, Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter, and it was, um, it was the beginning of something amazing. It really was. And it's a shame that these are so hard to come by today. And the last three games that I want to talk about, uh, very, very quickly, just for memory's sake, and any, any excuse I have to talk about this, I'll always take it, so bear with me. Uh, there were three Shining games that were released on the Saturn, and if you don't know what the Shining series is, shame on you! It, uh, it started off with Shining in the Darkness on the Sega Genesis. I'm going to cover all of these in time. Uh, and then there was Shining Force and Shining Force 2, and there was Shining Force CD, which was released on the Sega CD. And like I say, I'm going to cover every single one of these because, well, I want to. I love the series. And Shining Force is a, like a cousin to Fire Emblem. And I love Fire Emblem. And at this point in time, Fire Emblem was not being released in North America. So the only experience I could have with Fire Emblem was through my friend through imports. And that sucked because they weren't at my house. So with, the, with Shining Force, I could. I could play these. I had them on my Sega Genesis. It was a blast. I had Shining Force CD on my Sega CD, and I loved it. And when I found out that you know, we were going to have Shining Force 3, I was like, yeah! It just sucks that this is the first of three scenarios. And yes, today there's fan translations that you can go out and you can go ahead and, um, and play them now, today. But back then, you couldn't. And this was released in 1998, and this is actually another one of those sought-after games that's uh, extremely uh, hard to find these days. Uh, what am I doing? Okay. Uh, the other one was, this is one of my favorite Sega Saturn games, and that's Shining Force, uh, Shining Force, Shining the Holy Ark. This is actually a follow-up to Shining in the Darkness, so it's the same sort of idea where you have first person uh, gameplay and then um, third person battles and amazing I mean amazing I still go back and play this one because I just I don't know something it's the nostalgia I guess I love the graphics I love the audio love the gameplay it's just it's a very fun game and Shining Force 3 is also amazing if you like like strategy games tactical strategy games like Fire Emblem Shining Force 3 was amazing and anyway, the last one that I'm going to show is Shining Wisdom. And Shining Wisdom, uh, it's sort of like a, a Zelda take on the series. And these were all made by Camelot. And, uh, and that's a really fun one too that I really need to get to review. Goodness, I'm, I'm slacking off here. Got to review more of these games. This is another, they're all, well, no, 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 no. Let me rephrase that. This is a 2D uh, game. Those ones use sprite based uh, graphics, but also 3D polygonal graphics. But this one is pretty much entirely 2D. Uh, it has some FMV sequences and things like that, but it uh, was brought over by Working Designs, and I'm happy that they did that because we at least got three amazing Shining games. We got three amazing Panzer Dragoon games, and there is a wealth of other games that I could talk about. But I think I'm going to wrap it up and just say that the Sega Saturn is a truly underrated console and it, for its time. And I am so happy that today, uh, with channels like the one you're watching right now, we get to uh, experience, or at least you get to experience, the Sega Saturn if you never did before. One word of warning I have, though, for the Saturn is it is an extremely expensive console to collect for today. Almost every single game now goes for $50 or more, and some of the, the really heavy hitters go for multiple hundreds of dollars, and 
th that's you know it's a, it's a hard system to recommend to collect for but it's a fantastic system to experience so if you have the opportunity uh i really highly recommend you go check out a sega saturn and that's pretty much my wrap up so happy 20th anniversary happy 20th birthday to the sega saturn we miss you and uh, sega as a whole we really miss you you just aren't the same anymore so thanks for watching everyone and i will see you all in the next video